So today I'm reading from Matthew 11, 28 uh, to 30. We're in a series called Busy, looking at how our busy, full, distracted lives are killing our fruitfulness and even possibly killing us. Um, we've been looking at distraction, looking at the battle for your attention. Um, been looking at, or we're going to look at work in the coming weeks. How do we actually have a good relationship with work and look at family, uh, including church family. Today, we're looking at rest and we could do an entire series just on rest. There are different kinds of rest, different ways to rest, different battles for rest. Uh, and it's a very difficult thing, actually, even just in preparing to talk about today, difficult thing to, uh, to try to broach in one session, one sermon, because there were people here or watching, g'day if you're watching later on, um, people who are desperately in need of rest, different kinds of rest, like mental rest, physical rest, work rest, relational rest, spiritual rest. And there will be people who need more of a kind of, you know, far up the rear because they're resting too much and have, uh, either way, a bad relationship to rest. And so uh, as we are reading this today, um, we'll see Jesus actually addresses a particular section of people (coughs) and addresses their relationship with rest. So today, if that's you, and I suspect that for most of us, we will be the address ease that Jesus is talking to today. Um, Those who perhaps don't have a great relationship with rest, but not so much on the lazy side, probably more on the, the other side of rest. So let's hear from Jesus, and then we'll pray, and then we'll see what God have for us today. This Jesus says, come to me, All of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I'm lowly and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Very, very famous passage of scripture, very famous saying of Jesus. Let's pray and open up our hearts and minds to what the Spirit would do for us and through us today. Father God, I wanna thank you for these words from Jesus. Thank you that you love us so well. You really are a a wonderful father and friend to us. So help us to have open hearts and minds like we just spoke about. Uh, Open to your spirit, open to your scriptures, open to your will and your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So firstly, who is Jesus inviting to rest? As we're looking at people who live in Adelaide in 2022, uh, we've just come through a pandemic, just come through, for me, one of, like uh, meeting with these um, people from all over the world, really, over the last couple of weeks, uh, last couple of days, I should say, this week, people asking things like, oh, what's it like in Adelaide at the moment? How's it going? It, for me, from, in my memory, it's been one of the longest, coldest, wettest winters. I've lived here 25 years now. I do not remember a colder, wetter, longer winter. Unbelievable. We're doing some landscaping at our house. We had the grass dug out like six weeks ago. We needed three consecutive days of no rain to poison the grass that remained before laying new grass. We have not had three consecutive days without rain to be able to do this. It is cold, it's long, it's wet, it's wintry. uh, And we're just today, phenomenal kind of the hope of spring and of summer finally coming through. Uh, But it's kind of perhaps... You know, uh, one of the pastors on the weekend, uh, on the week said to me, man, 2020 has been the longest year on record. It's still going, start of the pandemic. It just feels like that year has just continued now uh, to the back half of 2022. And Jesus invites a group of people to rest. Who is he inviting to rest? The weary and the burdened. He's saying, are you weary? Are you burdened? Come and rest. It's not saying, are you, are you lazy? I read an article this week in preparation for this. Studies going into uh, Gen Zs. I I am right on the cusp of like Gen X to millennial. So depending on who you ask, I'm in that kind of range, early 80s. Uh, And millennials, man, for the last 20 years have been the butt of every demographer's joke. Uh, Every sociologist calling Gen Gen Ys or millennials lazy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, And finally, we've got these Gen Zs coming up even lazier. So finally, us millennials have someone else to, uh, to talk poorly off. <laughs> anyway, there's a study of Gen Z saying, uh, we only want to do meaningful work. 
We don't want to just work for work's sake. In fact, we don't even want meaningful work. We, just, we don't want to work at all. We just want to do what brings us pleasure, joy, fulfillment outside of work. We don't, we, don't, we don't even want to work for money. We want the government to give us money so we can go do whatever it is we want to do. That's not who Jesus is talking to in, in this part. There are other parts. Jesus speaks to those kinds of people. Jesus says, are you weary? Are you burdened? Come to me. Uh, just in regular life, in pastoral kind of work, uh, chatting with friends, uh, we are, we've talked about it the last couple of weeks, looking at busy, we are, as a general culture, weary and burdened. And so not only to us as individuals, I think even to us as a culture, Jesus is saying, come to me if you are weary and if you are burdened. And if that's you, you are invited by Jesus into his rest. What does that mean? What does that look like? That's a good point. Good question. Uh, Spurgeon, he points out, that there are those who are just spent with activity, so weary from work, that's the weariness, is I'm working hard, I've got long hours, I'm trying to get stuff done, or I just have to work just to live, and I'm weary from the work. That's the active needing of rest. And then there's this passive needing of rest, which is the burden, the heavy laden, the way down, those who mentally, emotionally, spiritually are just spent. So there's an active spentness, weariness from work, and there is a passive spentness from just the burdens and pressures of life. And Jesus says to both of those kinds of people, come to me. Are you weary from a never-ending work? Come to me. Are you re- weary from the weight of the world? Are you weary from the, the life that you wished you had that hasn't worked out the way you are? Come to me. Firstly, for those who are weary from working hard, um, we, we actually we are called into good work right from the very beginning, before the fall. God gives his people good work to do. We're actually going to spend a whole week looking at work, so I'm not going to go into it too much here. And, and for many of us, we enjoy work. I looked at this recently. Australians used to be like the land of the long weekend, known for our laziness or laid-backness, and yet we are one of the hardest working cultures or people in the world in terms of numbers of hours worked. And um, we have a bad relationship with work, and it leads to a bad relationship with rest. Either we work hard because we want to produce something, we want to make something, we want to make something of ourselves, we want to provide for our family, we're working hard to get something or something more than we have now. Uh, we are here, we're not satisfied with here, we want to go to there, so we work hard. Or for some, of us, for some of us, we work because we just, we have to. If I don't do this much work with my current opportunities, I don't eat or I don't pay the rent or I can't provide. All of those kinds of people are invited into Jesus' rest. We are not good at rest because we tend to think of rest for those kinds of people. We tend to think of rest as, I'm just going to run hard, go Uh, exhaust myself and then when I can't go any longer that's when I need a rest so I will stop just to overcome my exhaustion so I can pick it up again the next day and go again and that's how I know when it's time to rest because I physically or mentally cannot keep going any longer I've had those conversations today Um, I I just keep going keep going keep going I know it's time to rest because my body lets me know it's time to rest uh, because it starts to break down or we put up with things, so overwork, bad relationships, physical hardship, mental illness. We're like, well, I can still operate. I can still function. Therefore, I can keep going. I don't need rest now because I can still go to work. And I might not be at the top of my game, but I don't need a rest because I can, I can keep going. And that is the determining factor of whether or not we need rest. Well, can I get up the next day and keep going? Yes, therefore... I don't need rest anymore. But rest isn't just recovery. Rest isn't just go, 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 stop. Rest is right from the very beginning, God shows us uh, how we rest. In fact, the fact that God rests shows us that we need to rest. And the way that God rests shows us that we need to, how we need to rest. And how he inaugurates rest or how he inaugurates our day shows us how we rest. So if we go right back to the very beginning, 
day one of creation, this is what it says. There was an evening and there was a morning. One day, or day one, yours might say, your, your version might say. There was an evening and there was a morning, day one. Right from creation, God shows us that our days start, the rhythm of our days start at the evening, not in the morning. So we think of our evenings as, I'm going to work hard all day, or figurative days, uh, seasons, I'm going to work hard this season, and then when I get to nighttime, then I'm going to rest, going to collapse into bed, get up the next day, and go again. Work real hard mentally, work real hard with this relationship, work real hard in this vocation, work real hard whatever it is, exhaust myself, collapse, rest, in inverted commas, and go again the next day. Uh, but God invites us actually into this different rhythm where our day starts with rest. Here's our evening, here's our preparation, here's our rest, and in the morning, creative work out of our rest. It's an inverted view of rest. All of the Jewish holidays begin at sundown. That's the beginning of the day. The day begins here with our rest, and then the next day, we operate out of our rest. Not go, 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 collapse, rest, which is not actually, that's not actually rest, and then get up and operate the next day. Being operational is not the goal. Rest isn't to overcome exhaustion, it's to prepare for the day of fruitfulness. But it's also not just plugging in your battery so you can charge up and be productive again. So it's not like, let's be productive, and then I know now I need to rest so that tomorrow I can be productive again. So the rest is only functional and operative to get you functional and operative the next day. Rest is not just about that. We don't just rest so we can work. Uh, we know this even just from our bodies. If you physically exert yourself, you run, uh, go to the gym, work out, uh, dig a hole, whatever it is, if you do that and then don't rest afterwards, uh, then you don't recover well. Uh, if your goal is to grow or develop or get faster or stronger or um, more resilient, that won't happen if you don't rest afterwards and you make yourself more prone to injury. But also if you don't rest before you physically exert yourself in preparation for that physical exertion, then you won't perform as well. You won't run as fast, you won't lift as heavy, uh, you won't be able to dig as long, whatever the, whatever the exertion is you also won't grow and you're more prone to injury in the doing. Rest is both preparation for fruitfulness and a good day of fruitfulness's reward. It's both of those things. It's not just one, like, oh, I'm gonna go hard and then collapse and then I'm gonna make, you know, rest so I can make it for the next day. It's both preparation for fruitfulness and it's reward. But rest also isn't the only goal of work. <coughs> so in our culture, in Australia, we tend to, and again, Jesus might not be talking specifically to you, if you're more on the like, lazy end of work, uh, we're talking to the burdened and the weary right now. Uh, we have this philosophy of, well, I'm just working for the weekend, I'm just, my, you know, five days are for smashing out, and I'm gonna live uh, Friday evening to Sunday evening. Um, but rest isn't, Again, it's not just operative to get us bearing fruit again. We can bear fruit in rest as well. We need to actually work hard at rest. Rest is a gift for us. I'm going to show you in Scripture how rest is a gift. Rest is a, dis rest is a discipline. Rest shows us that we understand God's in control. It's not all up to me. Um, uh, man, recent research shows what we've known all along. Uh, it's possible that your lack, your frustration, your inability to overcome an obstacle, uh, your struggle, your injury, lack of productivity, lack of fruit is not from your not working hard. And so if you're not overcoming a barrier, it's possible, and this research suggests it could be true, you don't need to work harder to try to overcome it. It's actually because of lack of rest that you're not operating and functioning at your full capacity. For others, it's not just about the working hard. It's not just about the physical exhaustion. It's Jesus' call to rest from your working hard to try to get his attention. It's your rest from trying to gain his love, rest from trying to earn his affection. We think, oh, if I could just read my Bible more, if I could just pray more, if I just had better words to say, if I could just fast for longer, 
If I could just confess harder or whatever it is. If I could just do more, be more learned in doctrine. If I just serve, if I just serve more in the church, maybe then I would earn a better rest. Maybe then God would hear me and I could step into satisfaction. Maybe then I would feel this kind of rest that Jesus is leading me into. This kind of wearying work leads to the burden Jesus is talking about here, which actually weighs us down. It's the opposite of rest. Jesus isn't saying here, um, you don't need to work to rest. He's not saying don't fast. He's not saying don't um, pray. He's not saying don't read scripture. He's not saying any of those things. Uh, what he's saying is that your works don't lead to your rest in this kind of sense, but Jesus' work leads to our rest in this kind of sense. He's saying, take my works upon you and I'll give you rest. Are you weary from working hard or are you burdened from, from the cares of the world or trying to, to gain God's affection, to reach up to him, uh, to, to overcome some problem in your own strength? He says, stop it. He says, take my works upon you and I'll give you rest. Trying to attain the rest of Jesus based on anything but the works of Jesus only leads to further burden. So again, the more we try to burden ourselves with accomplishing the things for Jesus, the less rest we get. This is one of the traps the Pharisees and teachers of the law fell into in Jesus' day. Uh, Mark 2, um, we see this story. It says, On the Sabbath... Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to make their way, picking some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, have you never read what David and those who were with him did when he was in need and hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the, presence of the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and also gave some to his companions. Then he told them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. So then the Son of Man is Lord, even of, the, even of the Sabbath. So in all of this, he's trying to, Jesus is pointing to himself, saying, actually, uh, I am the Lord over all of the rules, all of the law, all of the institution. That's my law. So I can do whatever I want on the Sabbath. But then he also says, but what you're trying to do is you're taking a gift from God, rest, instituted in creation, when God rested and said, the rest is, my rest is holy, you will be a people of rest. It says you've taken that and inverted it where people need to earn their rest, where people, it's laborious and burdensome and legalistic that now people have to serve the Sabbath from the Pharisee's perspective. He says you've, you've inverted it. You've made it burdensome. It's a gift to rest. It's God's own rest that we're invited into and you have turned it on its head where people are serving the rest but the rest is there to serve you. Jesus says the Sabbath is for us. We are not made to keep the rules on rest. God gives us rest and shows us how to use it. It's the opposite. It's not, here's how you get to rest and follow these uh, rules. And the rules are what's important. And then you get the rest as the reward. Uh, You're invited into the rest as a gift. And then God shows us how to approach the rest and how to use the rest. (coughs) We see this in Hebrews 3 and 4. Great passage for you to do some homework in. Uh, This is where, like, it finishes, the writer of Hebrews finishes with this very well-known passage that doesn't necessarily sound all like rest. It says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. So saying, man, we, when, we come to, when we come to Jesus, we come with boldness. We don't come groveling on our knees. Because, because of who Jesus is and because of what he's accomplished, because of his work, we step into his rest with boldness. And what I love about Hebrews 
Uh, in fact, the entire book of Hebrews, but especially uh, chapters 3 and 4, if you start here, I actually missed the word, it says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. If you keep going back to find the beginning of this thought, you'll see paragraph after paragraph starts with therefore, therefore, for, for, therefore, therefore, for, for, therefore, all the way back to like the beginning of chapter 1 almost, but there's this little break in uh, the, the middle of chapter 3 where he begins this thought and he builds this logical progression, this chain of thought where he finishes with Therefore, because of all of this, because of all that we have seen, we come to God with boldness, into, into the very throne room of God with boldness. We step into his rest with boldness. And the beginning of this chain of, of thoughts, the therefore, 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 he says, consider Moses, who led his people out of slavery in Egypt and into the land of rest. This was God's doing. This was God echoing the rest of creation. This is God foreshadowing the rest that would come in Jesus. It says, consider Moses. God radically, miraculously brings him out of slavery through Moses. And then as they're wondering, things aren't happening on their timeline, not happening how they wanted. On the way to rest, it was a few day journey a few weeks max to get to the promised land. And it took them 40 years to get there. And the 40 years was God's judgment on his people because on the six day journey, they said, you know what? It was better where we came from. We want to go back. We don't like God's way. He's promised us this land of milk and honey and, and rest, the promised land. But we want to go back into slavery. They rebelled against God. And he says, okay, you won't enter my rest, those individuals. His people will still go into his rest. But a whole generation will pass 40 years wandering in the wilderness for a couple of week journey, max, because they didn't want God's rest. They wanted to go back to slavery. You might read, um, you know, wasn't our life better back when we were slaves than under God's lordship? And man, this is often the disposition of our hearts as well. There's something that I want. It's not coming on my time. I'm going to go work harder to get it. I'm going to burn myself out or flame out or whatever. Or this thing that, I, even objectively good thing that I really want, and it's not coming in God's timing. I'm, I'm out of here. Wasn't my life better under slavery? I'm going back. But it says, no, no, it, we, we don't want to be uh, like they were. He says over and over and over again, don't harden your hearts like those who did in the days of rebellion in, in that time. When you hear the Lord come to you and say, come into my rest, don't harden your heart and say, I'm going back to slavery. Say, yes, Lord, I will come into your rest. A key passage today, come to me. I will give you rest. It's a gift from God, a gift from Jesus, not based on your works, not because you've earned it, not because you're awesome, not because you figured it out, but based on his works. He gives you his rest. He is the one gifting you the rest, not based on your deserving rest, but on his deserving rest and desiring you to live in his rest. God always earns his rest. You see him say this uh, uh, during creation. Oh, it's good. It's good. It's good. It is very good. And he rests. And then commands us to rest. Because we, because we need rest, but also because it's good for us to rest. And it's not just any kind of rest. He invites us into his rest. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me. So we receive it as a gift, but we still need to learn how to use this rest, how to live in the rest, uh, and how to work out of our rest. Because often what we think of as rest is exhaustion and distraction. Uh, we work, 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 collapse, distraction, work, 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 collapse, distraction. Not rest, 
for distraction. What is rest? What is God's rest like? Let's have a look at those seven days of creation. When God says, this is very good and rests for a day, what does that rest look like? It looks like satisfaction. God is satisfied. He wants for nothing. He had work to do. He did that work. He sits back and he's, he's satisfied with his work. Even in the resting, there's satisfaction with his work. It's done. Nothing more to do, but there is something more to do. Enjoy his rest. And he does. He enjoys his work. He enjoys the result of his work. And he enjoys his rest. This is the same rest we are called into. A rest that is satisfied. A rest that is to be enjoyed. There is also peace here. No lingering work hanging over his head. I mean, he still has lots of work to do, but it's not, it's not kind of hanging over his head. Like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so snowed on. I can't enjoy uh, the work that I've done. I can't enjoy resting after the work I've done because there's way too much work to do. Uh, no, he has heaps of work left to do, and yet rests. He has relational unity, perfect relationship, in himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, unhindered relationship with his creation and within his creation. So it's it's not perfect, but it's flawless. It's not perfect in that he gives his creation work to do to make creation better, but it's, there is no flaw in his creation. These things are all true in Jesus as well. The rest that Jesus invites you into It's a satisfied rest. His work is final and complete on the cross. There's no work to try to achieve God's, uh, achieve righteousness because he gives us his righteousness. There's no work to try to get God's love or attention. He has given you, lavished you with his love and attention. Jesus' work is wholly sufficient to deal with your and my lack and failure. Totally sufficient totally satisfied. Peace is also true in Jesus. No more striving, again, for God's love or attention. (coughs) We have peace with God because of what Jesus has done and he invites you into that peaceful, satisfied rest. Relational unity as well. Restored, repaired relationship with God. Restored, repaired relationship with one another because of our union with Christ. This This is the rest that Jesus invites us into, and enjoyment. Living to please God is no longer on the deficit side of the ledger, trying to work our way into God's graces. We're not starting the work in the morning, working for the day and trying to rest at night. We start our work after we've already entered into Jesus' rest. So we are starting our work in the morning rested, in his rest and out of a position of rest. So we can enjoy our work out of rest rather than striving in our work to try to achieve the love of God. We have his love. We have his peace and we can enjoy the things he calls us to without striving to gain what we already have. We're not trying to get God to love us or hear us or to do what we want. We are God's kids on the greatest bring your kid to work day ever, where he invites us to his work. He lets us play with all the heavy machinery under his watchful care. And he enjoys us being with him, participating in his work. And he calls us to enjoy working with him, our loving, wonderful, heavenly father who lets us do all the cool things in his work with no with no uh, downside or risk because we un- we're under his loving supervision. And we get to participate in his good and his great work in the world from a place of rest. And God is inviting you into the same kind of rest that he has on the seventh day, that he purchased in Jesus and he is gifting to you today. 
saying, are you heavy, are you heavy laden? Are you burdened? Come and receive my rest. You don't earn it. He gives it. It's one of the reasons we call good rest recreation. It's recreating. It's participating in God's creative work in the world based out of rest. It's why he instigated Sabbath as a reminder of God's rest and a picture of the hope to come in Jesus. Not to bring us a burden. Man wasn't made for Sabbath. Rest was made for you and for me. It's made for us. And so like the writer of Hebrews says, don't harden your heart to his rest, but come if you're weary or burdened and receive his rest. Just take up my yoke, learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. It's not that run, 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 collapse kind of rest that just gets you through to the next day. It's a rest for your soul. It's actually an eternal Sabbath. I think regular rhythms of you know, a day off a week is very good, very healthy. Even two days off a week, fine, go for it. Um, you know, in partnership with good work and good rest, good rhythms of rest. Uh, but we are also in the eternal Sabbath now, the eternal rest of Jesus. That last part of Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weakness, but one has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, he, his door is open. He, the invitation is out. And he's saying to you, come and take my yoke upon you. There is work to do, but it's work done out of rest. It's the most wonderful reality to live in uh, and live in light of. Our homework for the week um, in discipleship groups is to look at our lives, consider our rhythms of rest, and not just the, the daily or weekly, you know, monthly, yearly rhythms of rest, but are we living in the eternal rest of the Sabbath? Are we uh, operating out of a position of rest? Or are we still, in some regards, trying to strive and struggle to get God's attention? We're going to do all of this work in our discipleship groups this week. Uh, you don't have to wait till then. Uh, you can do it you know, in your own time as well. Um, but man, this is too big a deal for us to just brush over. It's too important for us to not get right. Um, it will lead to, I mean, burden and weariness. If we don't have a correct perspective of, on rest, and this shouldn't be a laborious thing. I'm not trying to, you know, hassle you about this. I'm trying to echo Jesus' invitation to step into his rest. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. Thank you for his rest you've invited us into. It's just always and over and over so good to us. I'm sorry, we are sorry for those times we have not rested or not rested well or just powered through when uh, you've invited us into your rest. Help us to have a correct perspective on who you are to us your invitation to us, who we are to you, that we would boldly come before your throne, boldly step into your rest, that when we work, we can work, I mean, we can still work hard, Father, but not in order to attain rest, but out of a place of, of your rest. Help us to encourage one another uh, to love, to good deeds, good work, and to good rest. We would be involved in uh, that, the recreation, um, joining you in your work in the world. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name and for his sake. Amen.